Hello and welcome back. Today we are going to be diving into the topic of prejudice and discrimination. Understanding in a social psychology context how it happens, what social and cognitive factors contribute to the creation of prejudice, and how that leads into discrimination. So to begin today, it's important to distinguish the difference between prejudice and discrimination. So let's go ahead and take a look. The major difference between prejudice and discrimination can be characterized as a difference between attitude and behavior. Prejudice is an unjustifiable attitude towards a group, and it can be either positive or negative because we can have positive prejudice beliefs about a group of people that is in their favor, or we can have beliefs about a group of people that views them in a negative light. Discrimination, on the other hand, is the unjustifiable treatment of a group, and that is going to be a negative treatment. And so these two work together. The origin of discrimination lies in prejudice, and so it's important to understand where prejudice comes from in order to find out how to combat it. Nobody is born with prejudice, both positive and negative, towards any particular group. It is something that forms over time due to the social and cognitive factors that play a role in how we view the world around us. So today we're gonna to take a look at both the social and the cognitive factors that lead to prejudice so that we can learn how to identify them and then hopefully reverse them whenever they happen in our own lives. So let's go ahead and start today by looking at the social factors. And social factors that contribute to prejudice are typically things that are pre-existing in our society. They are the environmental influences that then we have to view and interpret and make a decision about in terms of what we are going to do with the information that we are presented. So it's usually the first step that then leads to the cognitive factors that will ultimately create the prejudice that each one of us has. A perfect example of this would be something like social inequalities, because these are the inequalities or the systemic issues that exist in our society that weren't necessarily created by us, and yet we see it on a day-to-day -day basis. What happens with these social inequalities is that it encourages or helps to justify the discriminatory treatment towards groups of people. Essentially, it leads to this cognitive thought pattern of these inequalities must exist for a reason. And so we sort of try to justify why they are there that can create prejudiced thinking. Another social factor that increases prejudice is what's known as in-group bias or in-group and out groups. We are all members of different groups in our society, and these are groups that are created based on things like race and ethnicity, culture, even organizations and clubs that we belong to. There are certain people that we relate to more and see like us. There are other individuals who we see as being not like us. This creates what's known as an in-group bias, where we view those that we view similar to us, we typically see them more favorably. So the existence, the social condition of belonging to these groups can lead to the cognitive factor of prejudice. And again, sometimes it is a positive prejudice where we view certain people more favorably because of the social factor that they are belonging to the same group that we are. And the final social factor that leads to prejudice is known as scapegoating, which you've probably heard of before because we see this happen a lot throughout history, where problems in a society are often blamed on members of the outgroup. So the social factor of societal ills, problems that are taking place for a group, are what are existing that lead to the cognitive factor of who do we blame for this? Who is responsible for this? And so oftentimes people try to place blame on someone other than themselves, which is what leads to scapegoating. It's not actually members of that group's fault, members of the out group, and yet we place blame on them to sort of pass off blame from the in group to the out group. 
And so these are the different social factors that can exist in a society that help set up the conditions for prejudice to exist. But we also have cognitive factors that we need to look at as well. Ways that our mind works to organize information that can also create prejudice for us as individuals. An example of this would be something like categorization. We know from previous units that the human brain likes organization. We want to make sense of the world as much as possible. And so one of the easiest ways that we do that is through gestalt psychology. We organize things, we group things based on things such as proximity or similarity. And so the first step towards prejudice might just be recognizing people, individuals, what they have in common and grouping them together into a category, a schema as it were, for groups of individuals. We might also experience something known as vivid cases. And that is where we have one really unique experience that then leads to a generalization about all members of that group. Think about having a bad experience at say a doctor's office leading you to not like any doctors. That would be how one vivid case can then lead to that generalization that can lead to that prejudice. Stereotyping is another cognitive factor that leads to prejudice, where perhaps we take those vivid cases and we start to generalize to the entire group. What we are doing is creating stereotypes, creating generalized beliefs about an entire group of people. And the just world phenomenon or just world hypothesis built off of those previously mentioned social inequalities because it's a cognitive factor that says people get what they deserve. And so oftentimes when we see inequalities exist in society, we start to rationalize or justify why they exist by saying they must have gotten what they deserve. And that helps to reinforce those prejudiced beliefs. Finally, there is one cognitive factor that also leads to more positive prejudice, and that is known as the halo effect, which is essentially that positive generalization that we might make about a group of people or an individual. It's essentially taking one positive factor and then creating conclusions about other aspects of a person's character just based on that single interaction. So if we meet someone and they are nice to us, we might also conclude that they are intelligent or thoughtful or worthy of our respect, even if it was based on a single interaction. That is what the halo effect can do. And so these are the social and cognitive factors that can lead to prejudice and eventually prejudice could lead to discrimination. And it's important to recognize that we all do this all the time. Again, our brains are primed to categorize and create schemas, and that can lead to generalizations and stereotypes and prejudice. So it's important to be aware of the sources. So when we have a prejudiced thought about members of our in-group or members of the out-group, we can start to question where that thought originated from and challenge some of these cognitive biases that we create in order to co combat prejudice as a whole. So up to this point, we've looked at a lot of things that contribute to negative behavior in society, from obedience to authority that leads to harming others, conformity to the group and the roles we take on, group dynamics, and now cognitive and social factors that lead to prejudice. So what are some of the other reasons why people are harmed in our society? One of the most famous stories that led to a breakthrough in social psychology is the story of Kitty Genovese. She was a young woman living in Queens, New York, and she was killed in front of 38 witnesses, none of whom came to her aid while she was being attacked on the street. And this led to a big question for a lot of people and that is, why did nobody come to her aid? Why did nobody help her? And what this showed us was a big piece of conformity that is known as the bystander effect or the diffusion of responsibility. When there is a large crowd of people watching an emergency or an event, we all expect somebody else to do something. We're all waiting for somebody else to step in and help. But because we're all waiting to do that, what happens is nobody does anything. 
And so in the wake of Kitty Genovese's murder, there were a series of studies that were created to help us understand how the bystander effect comes into play. And what we found is there's a three-step process in examining an emergency that determines whether or not a person is going to help in that situation. The first step is noticing the emergency. Of course, people who were not present for an emergency or did not know that there was an emergency going on are clearly not going to get involved or help in any way. The second part is interpreting the event as an emergency. Perhaps we see two people arguing on the street or getting into a fight. The second step is deciding, is this an emergency? Are they just playing around? Are they acting something out? Is someone in any serious danger here? That's the second part of the bystander effect, is for an individual to decide if this is an emergency or not. And then the third and final step is assuming responsibility. And this is where the bystander effect really comes into play. The more people there are witnessing what's interpreted as an emergency, the more the personal responsibility is diffused. It's spread out amongst the number of people who are watching. So everybody, again, expects someone else to step in and do something. They expect someone else to assume responsibility. And as a result, nobody gets involved and nobody helps. And the final way we see harm in social psychology is through the actual act of aggression. Any type of verbal or physical action intended to hurt or destroy another person. And the question is, why do we do it? Why do we see people who are aggressive? And again, social psychologists are going to look at both the social and the cognitive factors that are going to contribute to aggression. Of course, we know that there is some genetic influence involved in whether a person is aggressive or not. And there's also the social factor of whether or not a person has models of aggression in their lives. The more we see aggression in others, the more likely we are to replicate it. And the final piece is known as aversive events, which leads to one of my favorite vocab terms in psychology, which is known as the frustration aggression principle, which very simply states that when we are given frustrating or aversive events, a person is more likely to respond aggressively. That might not seem surprising because frustration can lead to aggression, but typically those three factors together, the genetic influence, the models for aggression, and the aversive events can all lead to an explanation for why we see certain individuals behaving more aggressively than others. So this is why we need to consider the environmental influences of the problems we see in society in order to have a chance to actually change them. The more we are aware of these social influences, the less likely we are to fall victim to them ourselves. So just by knowing about these traps, we'll be more likely to combat them in our own lives. And so our final lesson in social psychology will be looking at the positive side of social psych. We'll go ahead and take a look at helping and love and how our social situations can also set us up for success. So thank you so much for watching and remember, be kind to your mind.